Good morning and welcome to the Monday edition of Racing Across America. We wind up another week here at Saratoga, but we have a big lineup this morning. Coming up in a few minutes, Teresa Gennaro, Brooklyn Backstretch Blog, will join us. Part of the blog, she uh, keeps up with the Saratoga events calendar and we will kind of go through what's coming up over the next seven days as we are winding into Travers Week here at Saratoga. A lot of nice events to uh Cue you up on a little bit after that. Abigail Adset will join us, one of the trainers up here at Saratoga. Her dad used to train right across the street, the harness side. She got into the thoroughbred game. We'll talk a little bit with Abby in a while. And then John Velasquez, towards the uh, end of the hour, will join us. Having a great meet up here. We got some videos of some nice rides he's had, not just at the meet so far, but uh, all year long. Obviously, uh, first Saturday in May, one of the, the top ones on the 2017 resume. But we'll hit on all that with uh, Johnny coming up a little bit later on. Top of the show, however, you know him as the track announcer at Churchill Downs. Also, wintertime here at uh, New York. Uh, Saratoga, the morning line odds maker, and on the uh, pregame show and whatnot up here at Saratoga. Travis Stone, good morning, Travis. How are we doing? Good Very good. Here. Thanks for having me. Happy to have you here. Yeah. And uh, for folks who aren't familiar, you are a local guy. I am. Scroon Lake, New York, just an hour north of here. And uh, I was just saying before you came on the show, you move away and you realize when you come back how much you missed it. So that's <laughs> absolutely gorgeous up here. Uh, how, how young were you when you started to come to the track? It's funny. You said it was a picture of me in a stroller in the paddock <laughs> before. That's pretty good. I, I don't remember this at all, but there used to be no fences. There's never yeah, yeah, fences. Yeah, you could yeah. roam into the paddock, and there's a picture of me in a stroller in the paddock right next to a horse getting saddled. Yeah, my, my early days, I remember that. It's, it's mind-boggling now that it was like that, yeah. but I, I do remember the situation without the fences, and they saddled around the trees out there and whatnot. We talked about this before, but folks who may not have seen you on the, the show earlier, talk a little bit about your early days up here, and before you became a track announcer, kind of talking in to the, the tape recorder, and, and I remember your early days, Saratoga Special, the launch pad for a lot of people. You, uh, you had the, rate, the internet radio show in the early days of that internet radio thing, but you were working on like a closet and the, the special uh, offices back then. I worked for uh, Saratoga Special for two summers, which was, uh, I mean, it's, it's a grind up here for everybody that is involved in the game, regardless of whether or not um, you have horses or not. For everybody that's involved, it's worse for them, but I, it was literally a seven-day-a-week job writing for those guys, Sean and Joe. Clancy, but it was a lot of fun, and like you said, it was a big sort of a stepping point to allow my name to get out there a little bit, and uh, I used that time to call races on the roof, made a demo that I used to get the job at Louisiana Downs, I did the internet radio show, I remember interviewing Rick Dutro before St. Liam was going to run in the... Uh, <laughs> In the Whitney, it was a really fun interview. Was, I, I think I still have the uh, the file of it. But uh, yeah, just you know, grind away and and try and make a name for yourself and keep pressing the race calling on the side and get a little bit lucky along the way. And uh, now, of course, again, you're here in the winter time. You're up here at Saratoga in the summertime morning line. Uh, the the pregame show. Do you have a set schedule? It seems like you're about once a week in there. Um, I'm going to be on Thursday, and then I think I'm I'm on close. I know I'm on closing day. Okay. So about once a week or so. Yeah, a couple, so it's fun. Yeah, a couple more times, and uh, of course down at Churchill Downs. Uh, it was a great video. Is it still up, up there on YouTube calling the first yeah, Kentucky yeah. Derby? Yeah, it is. It's, uh, we put a GoPro in the booth and uh, captured the moment. And knock on wood, the call went well. So that's the cool video. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 just watching, cool moment. It's like, yeah, watching know, from afar, I can imagine yeah. what the moment must have been like. It was like. a moment of a lifetime. It truly yeah. was. You know, very um, exciting and emotional, but uh, it was cool. And uh, I'm glad we were able to capture it. And Thank God the call went well, because otherwise the video would be worth nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the beauty. Of it. You don't have to post it if it winds up. Too. Um, and uh, I always ask, you know, I've had Larry on here, I've had Tom on here, and I say, is it different working with the big crowd? Do you get the, the vibration through the booth, as it were? What's it like when you're calling in front of 140,000 people? Uh, nerve-wracking. Uh, <laughs> very nerve-wracking. Um, but it's also know, invigorating and exciting and you know, my goal on Derby Day and pretty much all of Derby Week is just to stay as calm as possible. I sort of um, try and disconnect even from the emotion of the Derby to try and stay in the right sort of mindset. And it, during the Derby Day itself, um, I don't get hung up on stuff. I don't listen to my old Kentucky home. I turn off the uh, the volume in the booth so I don't hear that. And just all the things that would start to cause some adrenaline to start to percolate a little bit, I don't. I, I just try and shut that out as much as possible. And is it a significant difference calling a 20-horse field? A uh, huge difference. It's um, it's just daunting, and it's it takes you forever to get through the field, and it's, it's not what you're used to. You can look at the binoculars every day. Even a 12 horse field sometimes feels like a lot, and when you add eight more horses to it, it's just that much more. It's it's way more than doubling a 10 horse field. This the the severity and the the 
intensity of having to work your way through that field while there's, I mean, you can hear the crowd on Derby Day, so the crowd's roaring, and of course it's the Derby, so you, you know, that on top of it, it's it's challenging. Are the rules of the road, as it were, in, in race calling, and that's where the 20 would start to come in, where you feel like, I got to get through the whole, like, in a two-turn race, I got to get through the whole field a couple of times, are there, there yeah. rules that you live by? There's um, a formula, or sort of an approach, a game plan, if you will, uh, they, you break them from the gate, and you start, you call what happens at the start, and hopefully you catch everything. You get to the eighth pull, and about the eighth pull, you reset. And so I always have a transition phrase, you know, beneath the shadow of the twin spires, something like that, and you go back up top. And now they're sort of right in front of you, so you can start to work your way through the field. And I will say the best advice I got for calling the derby, and I asked everybody that had called derbies before I called my first, and uh, was Tom. Tom Durkin said to me on the phone, he goes, when you start working your way through the field, he goes, this he goes, it's going to be intense. Just keep going. He goes, then you're getting to the 12th horse and the 14th horse and the 15th horse. He goes, you're going to start to panic. He goes, this is taking too long. I've never done this before. He said, keep going. And then you get to the 16th and the 17th. And he's like, at that time, you're, you're sweating bullets. You don't know what to do. He goes, keep going. You get to the 19th. You get to the 20th. He says, once you get to the 20th horse, you'll look up. There'll be five furlongs left. He goes, then you call a horse race for the last minute. Uh, that's true. And it was true. So yeah. true. I mean, I can remember... Getting to, and there were, I think, only 18 in my first year, a couple of scratches. I remember getting to the, about the sixth furlong pole. I was like the 15th horse. I was like, this is taking forever. But I just said, keep going. And sure enough, I look up, five furlongs left. There you go. So, uh, yeah, the vet, uh, the vet uh, passes, Obi-Wan passes on, uh, <laughs> yeah, as it yeah. were. Uh, Great so, advice. Yeah, some good information there. All right, I uh, want to talk a little bit about, about the morning line as well. But before we do that, I called for the replay of the uh, Alabama. I just wanted to get some of your thoughts on that um, because it was obviously the, the highlight of the weekend. It kicks mm -hmm. off a really nice week. Uh, the three-year-old girls on Saturday, the three-year-old boys coming up this Saturday in the Travers. This was a nice-looking performance from a late. I liked Salty. I thought she made a nice late run. The late's going to be the number seven horse. It is well. Comes out of the, the Delaware Oaks and runs a nice second in here. And then Salty makes a nice late move. Holy Helena, who wound up to be the betting favorite at 4-1, to one, winds up eighth in the field to nine. Unchained Melody pulled up. Uh, she was also in that 4-1 to one range. She was 9-2. to two. I was surprised. The betting public, I said to people during the day, I think you can make a case for six of them. The betting pro public proved that, I mean, with the favorite being 4-1. to one. I was a bit surprised at this, too, because when you look at, at buyer speed figures and some of the figures looking at this race, Elite did not tower over anybody. In fact, Unchained Melody... And lockdown had. I'd say Melody was where I thought the public would go. I thought so too. I made her morning line favorite. Yeah. I thought that was who would end up being the favorite. Uh, that was a big performance from Elaine. She's a nice filly. She's going the right direction. You mentioned Salty, who um, I'm friends with the, with Norm Cassie and the Cassie Racing and their crew. They're going to cut her back. I think the goal with her is a filly and mare sprint. I've long felt like her optimal scenario is probably going one turn. She puts in that one turn yeah. sort of, yeah. sort of like McCracken. Um, but it was a little bit of a disappointing performance from some of them. I understand that the attempt with New Money Honey, that was the time to try it on dirt. She's going to go back to turf now. Uh, Holy Helena was was not very good at all. Yeah. She's probably a synthetic, synthetic. turf horse as well. So that's why we run these races, to split them out. I never expected anybody to win the race like a late did. She was awesome. Yeah, it tosses her hat in the ring now. Everybody's chasing Abel Tasman, obviously. Right, right, right. Whereas the, the, the flip side, and we'll talk a little Travers, uh, because that comes up this weekend. The flip side is everybody's alive in the three-year-old boy division, right. uh, real male division, um, and I think this potentially has the, the opportunity to sort things out, but we've said that about a few races, but coming out of the, uh, you know, the Haskell, I think the, the horses that ran well down there have some potential to maybe uh, step forward. IRAP, I thought, got flattered by the Haskell mm -hmm. performance of Gervin, um, and IRAP, you don't think of the Indiana Derby, and the, the Ohio Derby as being players in the three-year-old division, could be this year. I think Baffert with West Coast yep. uh, has a potential player, but... You know, a horse like Always Dreaming with the Kentucky Derby on the resume is, is certainly a big contender as well. What are your thoughts going into the Travers? I mean, it, it, so if Always Dreaming wins the Travers, he's three-year-old champion, yeah. hands yeah. down. I think if Cloud Computing wins the Travers, he is probably in the conversation, but he would probably have to finish it off with one more win. And, it, you know, so that we can see how this shakes out. Who knows? But, I mean, you talk about – here's what's fascinating about the Travers is the Triple Crown is such a grind, and it's hard for these horses to sustain that form into the summer. But you look back – IRAP was involved in the spring. Gervin was involved in the spring. Yeah. Always Dreaming, Cloud Computing, Taprit. They're all set. They've all stuck around, and they're going to face off on Saturday. I think Taprit's going to be morning line favorite. He's got a big figure in the Belmont Stakes win. Um, and I actually think he helped himself. Not he did it, but by not running. So he doesn't run. Yeah. He couldn't lose a race like the Jim Dandy or the Haskell. And so his resume sort of stays a little bit more polished, whereas... 
mean, let's be honest, cloud computing and always dreaming, those were a couple of clunker performances in the Jim Dandy. On the flip side, you've got IRAP, who's on the way up, who continues to get flattered by performances coming out of his races. Gervin, that was a big breakthrough performance for him. And you've sort of got to toss in the horses like McCracken, who I think is a one-turn horse, but he's right there, too, in, in the conversation. It's, it's a so fascinating do a good, race. Uh, good Samaritan. You know, one of my favorite sayings in racing, the best time to try a turf horse on the dirt's the first time. And uh, I, I think sometimes it's hard to pair that up and, and come back with another uh, like performance. And I, I'm curious what you think. I felt like the Jim Dan, even though fractions rise and, and raw wise, it didn't look like they were moving. I felt like they were moving. They gapped out a little bit. It felt like the pace was honest. The track's been a little bit more deep this summer. So I think it was a little bit helped by that. And when you look at the PPs for Saturday's Travers, there's not much pace. I think outplay is probably the likely pace pace setter and it's not a, he's not exactly sprint speed so you can be up against, yeah. against it from that the lid over the track though is always a, a big angle especially this so, summer yeah, where it's, yeah. been, it's been a deep deep surface yeah. trainers tell me their horses are coming back to the barn exhausted um you got to be fit to win here but i think again given the scenario on the three-year-old male uh, division this year it's shaping up to be a really really intriguing uh, yeah. travers all right before we let you go as i say i wanted to get into a little of the morning line nuts and bolts you make mm -hmm. the morning line up here uh, the most unsung job in horse racing, not just up here. I think morning line anywhere is yeah. tough, but I think it's doubly tough up here. We've been in on some mornings doing the handicapper support, and you look at those baby races, and you're just up against it when you have a 10-horse field of babies. You don't know a thing about them, and no you shot. can't, even with, with like a Chad horse that looks good, you can't make them too short. It's just because right. you don't know what other bus saws might be in there. Talk a little bit about, about the mechanics of making the morning line. The entries come out. When does the work start for you? Uh, so, for example, the entries, they, they drew races yesterday. I will start on Thursday's morning line today. Have it done by, uh, I'll have it done today by 2. Um, I literally have a spreadsheet and a formula, and you just try and figure out how, how the race is going to shake out betting-wise. And so I'll look at the field. The first objective is to identify who's the most likely favorite is, and you look for key things, speed, figures, and then most of all, trainer. Uh, if you see Chad Brown's name, and go ahead and put him off to the side. He's probably the morning line favorite because he gets bet so hard up here and, and in general. Um, but then it's just an iterative process where you say, okay, I feel like this horse, and it's intuition on the initial line on the favorite, I feel like this horse is going to be, Tapper's going to be 3-1. to one. Who's second choice? Probably West Coast. Okay, West Coast, 4-1. to one. If West Coast is 4-1, to one, can Tapper be 3-1? to one? Sure, and then you just keep you know, iterating through it, and you say, okay, cloud computing and always dreaming. Maybe they're six. If they're six, can Gervin be eight? Eh, maybe not. You know, and you just keep you keep through, going through this process, and you're guided by the formula. You don't want to go above 130 points. Uh, it's sort of a complex formula, but at the end of the day, that's what you do. And all that has to happen is one horse gets bet differently, and obviously, it, it's you know everything else goes the other way, and then you can look like a fool in a minute. And uh, I'm curious. I think this has to be the case because uh, I know you you like to handicap and play as well. So like the rest of us, you're you're playing and, and watching from that aspect. But is there like a secondary victory for you during the day when you look at the Osborne and go, "Oh, nailed it"? I, yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I will. I don't tweet about it though because I'm not. I'm, I don't. I don't do <laughs> self praise is no praise at all. But um, I, I'm very proud when a good line comes out, and I'm also annoyed when when one yeah, comes yeah. out the other way too. And I tell you, the other thing that's frustrating is, as you said, if I'm on talking horses and I'm handicapping, having done the morning line two days prior. I'm looking at a horse, and I'm like, oh, man, now that I've fully handicapped this race, I've got this wrong. I'm going to pick this 820. It's going to be 4 to 1, and I'm going to look like an idiot. <laughs> and, it, it, but, and, again, I will also give you credit. It's tough. When we say it, and we comment on the morning like, that oh, that one looks real short. But, it, but it's such a tough job because you're doing it, and there's a time limit. You have to get it out because the PPs have to be printed a couple of days ahead for mm -hmm. the folks to take a look at. So yep. you're under a time pressure kind of thing, too. And as you say, then as you sit down and take a closer look, there may be one you go, oh, yeah. okay, I wish yeah. I had that one back. If I could have handicapped this card fully, I might have adjusted this horse yeah. a little bit more. Or you, when you really dive deep, you realize that this horse has been facing much tougher horses at Laurel, and in the essence of making a morning line, you don't have time to really yeah, go yeah. through and, and dive deeply into it, in, in that, unless you want to pull an all-nighter, which... I'd rather not pull an all-nighter doing morning line stuff and have more fun downtown. <laughs> I was going to say, wait, I think you pull a few all-nighters. Less, less Monday night, it's not a whole Naira crew. But, well, I was there, too. And Dave Rodman from Love, there was, like, yeah, multiple tracks. It was. It was great. Uh, the last Monday. But that's part of the fun of uh, Saratoga. Just before we go, I wanted to ask your opinion on uh, Arrogate, what you thought of the performance. And... Uh, Boy, I mean, it, it makes for a much more intriguing Breeders' Cup Classic. I'll tell you, I mean, if you watch his race last year at Del Mar, he didn't look like the Airgate we saw in the Travers. If you watch his race in the San Diego and then Pacific Classic 
I don't care what anybody says. I just don't think he particularly enjoys that surface. But I'm encouraged by Baffert's comments. He says, I, I'm telling you, it's not the surface. He says he was a little bit more alert this time around. He goes, I can fix this. And uh, tell you what, if there's anybody that can get a horse ready for the big race, it's Bob Baffert. So hopefully he can sort of rebound and, and you know, we can see the air gate we saw in Dubai. Unfortunately, there's a pretty good rival in Gunrunner, too. So it's and now like collected. And now collected as well <laughs> from the same barn. That's got to be awkward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't envy Bob. In well, that. Uh, uh, they had the full to American Pharaoh uh, yesterday uh, yeah. with, with Zayat having the other horse. And Zayat said to Baffert, eh, uh, you know, I, I'm sentimental on the full brother. Maybe we should pull our horse out. Baffert said, no, no, no. We'll, we'll both go. And Zayat <laughs> beat the, the full brother. So, uh, yeah, it's. It's always something in the yes. Baffert barn. But uh, as I say, it makes for a more intriguing story. I'm going to be interested when the NTR, NTRA poll comes out today to see if Gunrunner can leapfrog off the two performances. Maybe, now. but the two grade one wins that Airgate has, I think, probably Trump. Yeah, he was so far ahead. I'm going yeah. to be intrigued to see where the voters go this week. Travis, appreciate the visit. Appreciate the work you do. Uh, morning line and the calls uh, both here at Naira and at Churchill Downs. The pregame show over there as well. We'll be watching as you have a couple more times yep. uh, over there before the end of the meet. Uh, good luck going forward. Thank you. Appreciate it. Enjoy the Travers. Travers Travis Stone uh, from the New York Racing Association. Again, track caller down at Churchill as well. We'll take our break. When we come back, Teresa Gennaro will go over the calendar for the next few days. Stay with us. Hey, race fans, head down to the all-new Clubhouse Racebook. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat-screen TVs, state-of-the-art wagering terminals, and amazing Vegas-style atmosphere, the Clubhouse Racebook, 711 Central Avenue, Albany. No matter where in the world you are, the excitement of wagering on horse racing is just a click away. CapitalOTV.com offers live streaming, past performances, race replays, our virtual tote board, analysis and selections from professional handicappers, and a simple, safe, and secure wagering platform. And best of all, you get track prices. Going on now, it's Bet50, Get50. Simply open a Capital Bets account, bet $50, and get $50 cash back. CapitalOTV.com. Log on today. Nighttime Thoroughbred Racing is back at Capital OTB. Now through Labor Day, Capital OTB will be accepting wagers on nighttime thoroughbred racing from across the country. Featuring evening racing from Delmar and Woodbine, and now it's even easier to be part of the action. Simply log on to CapitalOTBBet.com on all your digital devices, or use our newly designed mobile app. So even when the sun goes down, thoroughbred racing continues at CapitalOTBBet.com. Log on today. Not at the track and not near a computer? No problem. Wager with Capital OTB's Touchtone Wagering System and you'll never get shut out again. Capital OTB's Touchtone Wagering System is quick, simple to use, and guarantees your wagers are accurate and placed on time. For more information, visit CapitalOTB.com or call Capital OTB's customer service hotline at 800-292-BET. Capital OTB's Touchtone Wagering System. Never get shut out again. In a recent study of some of the top online wagering sites, Capital OTB won big in total player rewards, far surpassing some of the best-known wagering sites in America. While other rewards programs simply offer you points redeemable for gift cards, Capital OTB's rebates are paid to you in actual cash. Plus, Capital OTB gives you full and immediate access to your money. So if all you're getting now are points and gift cards, join Capital OTB Player Rewards today and get cash back. Visit CapitalOTBBet.com and sign up today. This is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Welcome back. As always, happy to be joined by Teresa Gennaro, Brooklyn Backstretch blog, and much, much more. Also helps uh, pull in the guests here on our show throughout the season. Good morning. Good morning, Seth. Happy to you? have you on board. And uh, what I say, I would say, Brooklyn Backstretch and more, what... Uh, what were you sending out uh, via the print this week? I had some uh, recaps of the stakes races at Saratoga, which were pretty cool. Both of them were worn by fourth generation homebreds, which uh, was a nice, nice story for both of them. Uh, Saratogian column coming up tomorrow. Um, Travers related things, hopefully some history pieces. So. Oh, you had a what nice was the history piece you had just within the last week related to one of the stakes races. The Alabama coming. and the Barbarous Battalion. That might have been it, yeah. Or the t we were about the test, which was added to the calendar. It might have been the test. That yeah. sounds more familiar. Yeah, the it test. Was one is, of them I was and it's actually related to the Alabama. Is that there was some discussion among the horsemen that year that the horse that won the Alabama 
wasn't really the best horse, and so they put another race together, the test, oh. and they ran that instead <laughs> to try to determine, you know, the best filly. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, there you, there you go. Uh, always interesting to uh, learn. And, and I mentioned uh, the other day, because I had somebody ask me over at the track, this year, Alan Jerkins, uh, the Alan Jerkins, uh, used to be the King's Bishop, yeah. Alan Jerkins would be around. You were friends, obviously, with the Chief. Um, but somebody asked me the Four Star Dave, and they looked, and the number of runnings went back right. longer than Four Star Dave. And I said, and I'll say it again for folks who also may be curious, if they change the name, the number of runnings stays around. The right. Four Star Dave, as we said when we were in here the other day, used to be the Daryl's Joy. Yep. Uh, the Alan Jerkins, which starts this year, was the King's Bishop. Yep. So you'll see the Alan Jerkins this year is the first running under that name, but, but it will say, have been run for the such and such yeah. number of times. So yeah. folks are wondering, that's why. Yeah. Yeah, but which is funky when it's a horse that's only recently been retired, you know, so they say yeah. something like the 75th running of the Gopher Wand. Yeah. yeah. That's why. Yeah. Uh, but it's going to be fun to have uh, a race named after Alan Church. Absolutely. Certainly. All right, let's jump into uh, the calendar today. I uh, mentioned it a couple times already. I think one of the fun giveaways. I always like it. You can pack some stuff. You can use it for more than just the cooler bag. You can use it as a little bag just for carrying some stuff around. Yep. But it'll keep stuff cool as well. Cooler yep. bag giveaway today. Yep. Insulated third giveaway of the meat. Uh, always a popular item. Saw them stacked up when I was on my way in here this morning. And, You'll uh, find them on eBay later today. Yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe now, even. <laughs> Promos. Well, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if now. Yeah. But uh, I'm going to go over and get a couple and use them because, like I say, they're yeah. one of my favorite giveaways. They're perfect for uh, here. Free with uh, paid admission while supplies last. I right. like they have the, the Monday giveaways, too, for folks who maybe can't make it on the weekends. Sure. They've added those in. Uh, well, a lot of people are talking. And about 2.42 today, we will enjoy the solar eclipse, and it'll be tied in with some uh, events here at the track, as it were. Yeah, Naira has gotten together some of the local Eclipse Award-winning jockeys, Richard Migliori, Ramon Dominguez, and Angel Cordero. Uh, I think they will be up on the roof, and they will be providing something, details I'm not sure of. Um, but, you know, the idea is watch the Eclipse with Eclipse Award-winning jockeys. Um, Naira will also uh, delay the start of the fourth race by five minutes so that that will be sort of the peak um, of it for this area, and they'll also be broadcasting it on the board and on screens throughout the track. Don't look at it, Real, like serious. I mean, you know, yeah. it's it's funny, but you can do serious yeah. damage. Don't look, don't look at it. You, Watch the screen. Yeah, you are absolutely right. You can't yeah. look at the sun. Don't do not right. unless you have the special, and they have to be the special glasses. Which I don't know where you get them. They're not no, like you in the can local get them, but right also, I mean, so many people here have binoculars to watch the races. You can't have binoculars on combined with the eclipse special eclipse glasses because it screws it up and you still could hurt your eyes. Yeah, you do not so, want to be looking at the sun with binoculars under any circumstances, right. protection or not. That's yeah. yeah don't, so so again, and so that's our public service and, announcement. And yeah, yeah, I feel like somebody's mom, yeah. but uh, we don't want something to happen on Eclipse Day. Uh, uh, Watch it on the TV screen. Watch it on the best. TV. So that's what I'll yeah. be doing. And it's cool of Naira to do that. So. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I also want to toss out its restaurant week tied in with the Travers. Um, that goes from uh, yesterday through Thursday. Um, and there are a bunch of restaurants that are tied into this really throughout the whole area. I'm just going down the list of uh, Albany Schenectady restaurants. One over in Amsterdam, my old uh, stomping grounds. A couple here in Saratoga, Ravenous and the Parting Glass. And uh, what it is is you get a, a meal for $18.64, which was the inaugural running of the Travers, 1864. Yep. So a nice little tie-in. And, again, you can go to that website, uh, naira.com slash Travers1864, and it has the whole list of uh, uh, restaurants that will be involved. So that's a nice little event as well. Coming up uh, tomorrow, book signing of note. Yes, uh, over at the National Museum of Racing. It's uh, the writer, John Parada, the illustrator, Jen Ferguson. Um, they've done four books together. And uh, Tom Durkin did the audio book for these. And so he'll be over there to buy the book. Uh, and you can have um, any of the three of them sign it, which is, you know, pretty cool. Love the idea of Durkin doing the, uh, the audio book on this. And Parada was uh, a... Uh player in uh, HBO's Luck. He was a consultant. Yes. He actually yep. did some script writing for them. And, and he, he, after Luck was over, he also did uh, online. He was kind of doing, uh, blog isn't the right word, but he kept the story alive yep. online, which was kind of fun yeah. uh, yep. as well. And part of that was illustrated, I think, uh, by Jen also. So, yeah, and, uh, and she's got a really cool, distinctive um, style as well. I like her work a lot. So that's uh, tomorrow uh, across the street. Uh, is that the racing museum? Yeah, yeah, the, the racing, racing museum. museum. I'm yep. just looking. Uh, yeah. All right. And so that's uh, 
tomorrow uh, also Robbie Davis recognition comes up up at old friends at Cabin Creek which is the one of their Tuesday events yeah one of the and it's uh, the thoroughbred retirement facility that's uh, just a little bit out of town a 10 or 15 minute drive um, Robbie Davis has his family here three of his kids are jockeys and so they'll all be on hand just to do an appreciation of him he's a trainer now uh, and has stayed in the area recently became a grandfather as his son jockey Dylan Davis uh, and his fiance had a baby so, nice. Dope. So go up there, see Robbie, and hang out with the retired thoroughbreds. Some nice of your guy, old favorites, yeah. yeah. And uh, certainly, folks uh, who follow New York racing for as long as I did remember Robbie in his riding days. Now the kids are out there. Yeah. I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine on the backstretch yesterday who made a little bet on Jackie. Hey, the female jockey. They they jumped on board. Uh, yeah. Uh, any angle that works at the racetrack. Whatever works. it takes. Uh, color of the horse, name of the horse. <laughs> Me, I spend all afternoon doing the handicapping, and sometimes that works, and sometimes and sometimes the name or the color yeah. works better. A friend right. of mine had a twenty-three to one winner yesterday because he was really vocal in the paddock, and she thought that was a good sign. <laughs> Bingo. Bingo. Yeah. Well, as I say, <laughs> whatever works. Uh, coming up Wednesday, Trevor Stakes panel over at. Uh, the Racing Museum. Yeah, they haven't released the details of the speakers yet, as far as I can see, but uh, it'll be a nice event previewing the race and the entrance. That's Wednesday. Uh, the draw is Tuesday night. Uh, yeah. And it, always kind of a nice situation here at the race course when Naira takes time to, to kind of recognize some of the service providers mm -hmm. in society. They do it with the military people at one point during the meeting and, and uh, coming up Wednesday, first responders appreciation. Yeah, which is great. Firefighters, police officers, EMTs, bring your ID, you'll get in for free. There'll also be an exhibit uh, at the Berkshire Bank Pavilion, which will highlight some of their work. And uh, one of the favorite events out there uh, for both the young and old, the ice cream eating contest comes up on Wednesday. Yes. And it's fun to watch just up by the Jockey Silks Room. Yeah, and I think it's you know, who can ever eat a whole pint of ice cream the fastest. Sounds like a recipe for disaster for me, <laughs> but uh, and it's I think it's kids, teens, and adults. So go for it. Some of the but, best ice cream in town. As I say, always fun to watch uh, at the very least. Yeah, it would not be. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of iffy on ice cream. Give, I'm more pie and cake. I like ice cream, don't get me wrong. But, I eat ice cream but, every day. But, uh, <laughs> not a pint. Yeah, but still, I was going to say, yeah, still, even if you like it, uh, shoveling no. down a pint is a lot to ask. Yeah. Uh, and we had Michael Dubb in the other day who mm -hmm. talked about this, and really one of the, the, the nicer charity events up, up here every year because it's a great racing related charity. Belmont Child Care Association, uh, their <laughs> annual event comes up on Wednesday. Yep, supports the children of the backstretch workers who get low cost, affordable. Um, Early childhood education and child care uh, all year round, 365 days a year. Yeah. Uh, coming up uh, on Thursday, another uh, book signing. This one with our friend Alan Carter. A nice book on the history of the game. Yeah, which is so cool. It's a, it's a history of New York breads, and especially with the revitalization of the New York bread program, it's really cool that he's written this book that, as far as I can tell, no one's ever done before, how New York breads really got to be sort of uh, the pinnacle um, not the pinnacle of the sport, although they were at, at one time. But this is also nice because it dovetails nicely with um, Thoroughbred Showcase Day, New York Bread Showcase Day, which is also on Friday, a day full of stakes races for New York Reds. Always so. like to count our friend Andy Serling and his uh, uh, Parting Glass radio show uh, yeah. every Thursday night down the Parting Glass. Kicks off at 8 o'clock. Always a lot of fun. I head down. If I can get a seat, I have my hot turkey. Sit down and listen to Andy. And uh, Great night. Always fun. A nice crowd of, of like-minded people. Yeah. Yeah, and don't know the guests yet, but they'll be posted at brooklynbackstretch.com as soon as they come out. Uh, coming up on Friday, and again, we're going to have uh, Jeff Canizzo uh, to talk a little bit more about the uh, New York Reds coming up later in the week, but New York Showcase Day uh, on Friday, as well as Red Jacket Ceremony Day. Yeah, so, you know, a couple of years ago, Naira built the Walk of Fame back behind the grandstand and has inducted a variety of racing luminaries, and this year the lone inductee is Ramon Dominguez, the man about whom nobody has ever said a bad word great jockey you unfortunately had to retire too soon but certainly worthy of uh, of joining alan jerkins and bill mott and angel cordero and john velasquez and the many others who were in there on the eve of the travers we have yep. a wine and cheese social so if folks want to take advantage of some of those social events that sounds like a good one yeah that's at the racing museum also uh different price points for members and non-members both very affordable and just a little you know kick off travers night nice well travers eve and yet one more uh, book, Man of War, A Legend Like Lightning. That uh, signing is coming up as well on Saturday, is that? Or, um, is that also Friday? I, I think, think that's, that's, that's also Friday. Friday. Evening. That is, that's that Friday, Friday evening. Yep. It's by Dorothy Hours, who's written a number of terrific racing books. This is the 100th anniversary of Man of War's birth. Uh, and there's also a Man of War exhibit at the museum as well. And uh, again, coming up 
on uh, Friday, Sunday. Uh, I didn't mention it earlier. Today and this coming Sunday, uh, the roller contest continues yeah. all Sundays and Mondays. Uh, again, uh, I highly recommend uh, the low roller contest. Kind of makes you think a little bit differently yeah. about things. All right. A lot going on. I think it is. It's Travers Week, so yeah. uh, as you would expect. Lots of uh, activities to take advantage of here at the racetrack, as well as the racing. Beautiful day today. Beautiful. Yeah, Perfect. We've got a few of those, and uh, this is just another yeah. uh, during the Saratoga meet. All right. Again, folks can find the entire calendar coming up soon at Brooklyn Backstretch. Yep. Check out the blog and all of Teresa's work, which is linked to via Brooklyn Backstretch. Absolutely. If you're yeah, in other there. places as well, yeah. they can check that all out. All right. We're going to take a break. When we come back, Abigail Adset is in the house. We'll talk to her in a few. A little bit later, Johnny Velasquez. Stay tuned. All of that when we come back. This is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. I'm Mark Cassano. Join me Saturday mornings at 10 for Down the Stretch. We'll inform, analyze, and welcome in the biggest names in racing. So join me Saturday mornings at 10 for Down the Stretch, right here on the OTB television network. What if there was a way to become a better horse player, to have a better knowledge of the game, to be more successful? What if there were a way to take what you've learned, what you know, and make better decisions? better choices, to know how to connect the dots. In horse racing, knowledge is a powerful tool, but not the only tool. Race results and replays, past performances and live streaming, wagering from all your digital devices. These two are important tools, and you'll find them all right here at Capital OTB. Capital OTB, become a better horse player. With more than 60 Easy Bet and Branch locations throughout the region, you're just a short drive from all the top tracks across the country and around the world. For a complete list of all Easy Bet and Branch locations, visit CapitalOTB.com. Capital OTB, we're closer than you think. I'm Steve Beck. And I'm Seth Merrill. Together we're loose on the lead on Capital OTB, Sundays at 10 a.m. Why should they watch, Seth? Sit down on Sunday, have a bagel, get some great racing conversation. Cream cheese only, no jelly. Sundays, 10 a.m., loose on the lead, Capital OTB. Welcome back. As promised before the break, happy to be joined now by Abigail Adset, trainer up here at Saratoga. Good morning. Good morning. Happy to have you join us back here to talk a little bit about the training side of the game. We've had you on before, but for folks who uh, didn't see you on that visit, uh, fill us in a little bit again on your background. I know your dad was across the street as a harness trainer. Talk about sure. growing up in the game on that side and then coming over here on the thoroughbred side. Sure. So my dad trained standard red horses and... Um I was born right into the game as far as working with horses and being around horses and I absolutely loved to ride and there's someone asked when was the, when did you first get on a horse and I actually have a baby picture of my dad placing me on top and I was like wait, a couple months old maybe and uh, anyhow it just segued in my love of racing and riding can you know it's perfect for for this and it segued right in did you ever work out his horse? Did you ever ride in the Sulky? And I did, yeah. I drove, I trained, I went everywhere. I have a lot of respect for standard red, you know, trainers, owners, et cetera. Uh, it's, a, it's a great game, and I'm thankful to have the knowledge from that and bring it over here. Yeah, I was interested. We were up at Woodbine for Queen's Plate, and Don Lupel, the, the paddock commentator up there, she was trained and owned through, uh, uh, standard bred yeah. horses for a while before she got into the, the handicapping side of things. Sure, sure, yeah. It's a great, it's a great part of the industry. Yeah, and uh, 
So you had the, the, the family bra- background that got you into it, and you talk about uh, riding. Uh, do you still get out and ride in the morning? I do, yep. So I, growing up, I did show jumping, I barrel raced, I played polo, et cetera, and then I got more specific into riding the thoroughbreds, and that I knew was it. And I always knew I wanted to train. When I was younger, I didn't quite know if it would be thoroughbreds or if I wanted to train standard breads. And uh, I went ahead and I went on with my thoroughbred portion of it. And uh, so anyhow, uh, I've been riding my whole life and still ride. I have been I get on a few horses each day. So you're working your own horses? Yes. Does that give you a different insight as a trainer, do you think? I do. I think it's a, definitely another variable that... I mean, knowledge is power, so, and I've been doing this, it's second nature to me. I can get on a horse and walk several strides and feel what's going on, let alone when you turn around and gallop them, et cetera. So uh, I do think it's, it's, a, it's an advantage. You and I were talking before we went on the air, and I, I said, do you ever train back here on Clare Court? Because I've been waiting for a trainer to come in to talk a little bit about that. And you said, you, now you're over on the Oklahoma side, so not as much, but you have been out here on Clare Court. And then you started to explain it to me. And, and for our audience, because every morning they see the horses working out behind us, and it is not a formal racetrack, clearly. Right. And so I've always wondered, how do you parse out when to bring a horse over there as opposed to the more formal racetrack for a morning kind of a situation? And you had a great explanation. Yeah, so the, I love Clare Court. Um, I mean, I always think of Val and Jerkins, the chief, when it comes to the Clare Court. It's a great change of pace for the horses. I mean, and like I said to you before, if you go and you're working out 45 minutes a day on a treadmill for a year straight, you're going to, the monotony, you're going to get bored. And so when you have a change of pace, it freshens you up and you don't realize okay well, oh you went for a hike today you're getting maybe more of a workout but it's a great change of pace mentally yeah. for you and, and it, it clearly you know we sit in here in the morning and they work out behind us you can just kind of tell i mean i'm not no i do not recognize the physicality or the mentality as well as you do but you look back and you can tell they, they seem to really enjoy it right and a, a lot of times i mean trainers take advantage of it but uh, you'll see a lot of you know nervous horses out there so they'll be bouncing around because this is a it's a quieter, smaller track as opposed to the Maine or the Oklahoma. Talk a little bit about Oklahoma and, and being stabled over there, because again, you're across the street, you're a little bit away from the the hubbub mm-hmm. uh, on the main side. You know, the main side. There's breakfast in the morning, so there's a little bit of a crowd over here in the morning, and I, I'm assuming that's a just a little more of a relaxed atmosphere across the street. Yeah, I think as far as it's just as. Uh, professional we get people over there but as I absolutely love being stabled there um, I'm literally in between both tracks both you know the main side and Oklahoma I'm right across from the kitchen uh, I have I share a barn with Chad Brown part of my barn and Gary Contessa is behind me uh, it's quiet you have trees you have grass it's a much more relaxing environment where I am as opposed to where I've been stabled previously on the main and, uh, you know, you talk about Saratoga, trees and grass and, and whatnot. Um, for years, people have said the horses really enjoy it. Uh, some of them, come when they come, I mean, Four Star Dave is the great example of what came up here and flourished up here. Yeah. Do you notice that with some of your horses? They get up here and they just, the yeah. atmosphere uh, is different. In nature. Sure. Maybe the air is cleaner, fresher. I don't know. But horses do, it's somewhat surprising because it's more of a, quote, unquote, stressful meet. You know, there's a lot more pressure. People are entering more aggressive, um, but the horses themselves oftentimes do flourish here. And I think a lot is like the open shed rows. They have their heads out. They're, you know, not in an inside barn, which obviously you would need during the winter time. Yeah. But taking advantage of it like this now, it's a great, great spot for the horses. Uh, I checked out your Twitter feed uh, last night and prep for this, and as I scrolled down, uh, I saw a, a family picture of Marshall Graham uh, out in the paddock, and we had Marshall on with us on Sunday morning a couple of weeks ago. W- what an interesting guy. I mean, he's a, a college professor, but he he attributes horse racing to, to getting him tenure. He, he'd written a bunch of papers on horse racing, the efficiency of paramutual markets and whatnot, but he also has a stable 10-strike racing uh, also had a picture on your uh, website, yes, or on your uh, Twitter feed yesterday of Rodeo Wind, mm-hmm. who races for 10 Strike Racing. Talk a little bit about how, how you got teamed up with Marshall. So Marshall Graham was uh, referred to me from somebody that I was dear friends with, a trainer, and um, long story short, 
we I started claiming horses for him, and we've had a great amount of success together. It's been an absolute pleasure getting to know him and his family, and watching him grow as an owner, and at the same time I'm growing as a trainer, and um, just but his genuine, and he's a good man, and he's got morals. Uh, it's been an absolute joy to train for. He understands the game. Yeah, and that was the fun about having him on. I mean, he's. He's a horse owner. He plays in the handicapping yeah. tournaments. He breeds uh, horses as yeah. well. That, that's a so, homebred, yeah, right? Yeah, so Rodeo wins a homebred. Uh, his, he had the mare. Um, actually, Rodeo wins half-sister is Tainted Angel, who I had and you know, ran early in her two-year-old career. And then, long story short, got claimed in the fall of Belmont. Rudy Rodriguez claimed her, but uh, she was very, you know, very useful filly, and this is her half-sister, different dad, same mom. Nice. That's got to be fun for everybody involved sure. when you bring them to the racetrack from that kind of situation. You mentioned claiming. Uh, when we tried, to, we tried to get you on a week or so ago, and once we made contact, you were in the process of claiming a horse. I'm always intrigued with the nuts and bolts of the game, and a lot of people who are in our audience up here at Saratoga new to the game. Walk us through a claiming situation, because I'm assuming if you're on the claiming side of the game, you're looking, you're making check marks on race days when you look at horses to say, hey, maybe down the road we'll take a look if this horse gets back in for a claim. So now the entries come out, and one of those horses you're looking at is in there. Sure. How do you proceed? What are the nuts and bolts of, of making the claim? So I mean, per personally, and then it goes with my territory of being a trainer, I live, eat, and breathe the races. So, and then I watch horses train, et cetera. And like you said, if you see a horse that gets put in for a tag and you think it's worthwhile, you can go in for it. But um, so I stay active in, in all the claims. Um, and then depending on my, my owner basis, try to you know see which individual owner would like and then suggest that I never force a horse on anybody uh, but they can I'll suggest it and nine times out of ten it, it works but uh, I'll contact an owner and I usually I'm an authorized agent and then I can you know sign for them etc and then you drop a slip and then it's luck of the draw as far as if there's multiple people that drop you literally put slips in and they're numbered and if you go in the race office after a claiming race, you'll you heel them shake, and there's dice that are numbered, and they'll pull out the number, and they'll say one and or two, and they'll pull that number, and they'll flip that slip, and whoever's name's there is there. So. You you said you got the one the other day. Was there a shake for that one? Yes, there was. Yep, yep. I got a, a horse, uh, bluegrass prevails. So so there's a little gambling on the uh, other side. Yeah, of the you end. have to have lady <laughs> luck on your side for yeah, sure. Very good. We should also mention you're, you're a Union College graduate, correct? I am. Yeah, that was blessed. I had a academic scholarship there, and I had four years of bachelor's of arts in English, and uh, poli sci music minor, and uh, it was a great four years just to broaden my horizons personally. And if I read correctly, two days after you graduated, you were on the racetrack? Oh, right back. <laughs> right back. <laughs> and nice. Uh, we like that. And just again, to, to relate back to that claiming game. So now uh, you win the shake. The, the tag goes on the horse. Uh, it goes back to your barn. What's the process when you get a new horse in the barn? So I, I let them come out of the race, give them a couple days, usually two, three days. And from there, I just try to work from the inside out. So I, oftentimes, you know, there's different tools that we can use as far as wormers and you know I always check their teeth and check their feet out and just try to do an overhaul um, on what I think I can improve on and then look in the condition book there for, you go. For, for the uh, next start That's right. and before I let you go I'll also uh, whenever I have uh, trainers on I'd like to give them a, a chance to tip their cap to the owners and the staff and I know we've already talked about Marshall Graham and sure. appreciating the ownership there but I also want to give, give you a chance to thank the staff because isn't your dad part of your staff too? Absolutely my dad worked right next to me as I had for him my whole life and so it's been a it's it's great having him on the team with me and I have a great staff and a great group of grooms and um, and a good riders etc and and uh, it's nice I've had Rosebud Stables has been unbelievable to me and supportive and uh, getting the ups and downs of this game, which we all go through. And uh, it looks like I'm on the upside of things and picked up some new owners that I'm looking forward to working with and training for and uh, train for, uh, you know, claim and train for Funky Monkey. And uh, there's it's it's been it's been well. I'm appreciative of everyone. You got a big dog too. 
That's Hunter, yes. And, and we want to thank you. I know about the big dog because you had it down at the teletheater, down the race book down in Albany because you were part of our PDJF uh, fundraiser. We That's appreciate it. Your, yeah, I just could, was on my way from Belmont up here for the first time, and so my car was full and I had my dog big with dog. me. Yeah, yeah, nice. <laughs> Uh, Abby, we appreciate the visit this morning. We certainly wish you uh, uh, good luck going forward uh, on the remainder of the meet and Thank then downstate so as well. Thank you. Abigail Adset, trainer here on the uh, New York Racing Circuit. All right, we'll take a break. When we come back, one of the top jockeys here in New York, John, John Velasquez, excuse me, John Velasquez joins us right after this. Stay tuned. No matter where in the world you are, the excitement of wagering on horse racing is just a click away. Bet any place, any time at CapitalOTBBet.com. And be sure to download our new mobile app from the iTunes Store or Google Play. Come on. I want sales reports on my desk by Monday. Whoops. My bad. Love racing? RTN brings you every live simulcast on your home television, plus live video streaming and race replays on your PC and mobile devices. To order, visit RTN.TV. RTN, a breed apart. Hey, race fans, head down to the all-new Clubhouse Racebook and get in the game. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat-screen TVs, state-of-the-art wagering terminals, fantastic food and drinks, an amazing Vegas-style atmosphere with seating for nearly 900 of your closest friends. Conveniently located at 711 Central Avenue, right off exit 5 of I-90 in Albany, the Clubhouse Racebook is the better choice. Nighttime thoroughbred racing is back at Capital OTB. Now through Labor Day, Capital OTB will be accepting wagers on nighttime thoroughbred racing from across the country. Featuring evening racing from Delmar and Woodbine, and now it's even easier to be part of the action. Simply log on to CapitalOTVBet.com on all your digital devices, or use our newly designed mobile app. So even when the sun goes down, Thoroughbred Racing continues at CapitalOTVBet.com. Log on today. In a recent study of some of the top online wagering sites, Capital OTB won big in total player rewards, far surpassing some of the best-known wagering sites in America. While other rewards programs simply offer you points redeemable for gift cards, Capital OTB's rebates are paid to you in actual cash. Plus, Capital OTB gives you full and immediate access to your money. So if all you're getting now are points and gift cards, join Capital OTB Player Rewards today and get cash back. Visit CapitalOTBBet.com and sign up today. This is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Welcome back to Racing Across America on a Monday morning. Always happy to be joined, really, any jockey, because they're very busy here in the mornings, but certainly uh, nobody busier than Johnny Velasquez with a pretty good uh, Saratoga season under his belt, said he just came over from some turf workouts. Appreciate the visit. Good morning. Good morning. Happy to have you on board to talk a little bit about the jockey side of things. And, uh, yeah, turf workouts on, on Mondays and Fridays, you yeah. said uh, with uh, the number crazy. of turf work, yeah, yeah, workouts. Yeah, the horses we get in there, though, you know. And, uh, normally they are, uh, like yesterday or the day before, or they give you a special permit that you, know, so you can go in and maybe you get one or two horses in there. Uh, Mondays and Friday, there's a crazy lot. And Many turf works are there. always over Oklahoma, Oklahoma, right? Oklahoma, yeah. We don't, we don't get to work here on the main track. Are turf workouts, from a jockey's perspective, are they any different than the, a dirt workout, or is it just the surface? Uh, it's just the surface, you know, really. And, and uh, what the horses prefer, you know. And they, they probably work better on the grass. They will work on the, uh, on the dirt. So if the horse likes the surface better, that's what the, you like to work them to see how they do. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. I wanted to kick off. I wanted to watch some replays and talk a little bit nuts and bolts as well. But I wanted to start with a replay. It's just uh, our man Mick uh, was setting the cameras, mentioned it. I wanted to go back for Saturday in May, the Kentucky Derby. Probably never get tired of this replay, oh, yeah. right? Uh, and, absolutely uh, not. <laughs> <laughs> we'll watch number uh, five, Always Dreaming, get it done pretty easily, too. A chart margin of uh, two and three quarters. It was for trainer Todd Pletcher, which, again, for folks who watch New York Racing have long enough, they know you've been a boat team up here, so it had to be uh, extra special. But we're on an off track that, that he clearly liked it. Uh, just talk us through coming down the stretch. And, and as you get to this point where you, I don't do you ever, well, I, I, I was going to say, do you ever re really feel like, yeah, I got it in the, the bag. But what, the way he did it, you had to feel pretty good about the last sixteenth of a mile. Take yeah, no, well, as soon as we got, we got down the stretch and he switched and I started asking him to run and he responded right away. Um, I was very very happy the way I was doing it. By the eight pole, I took a big back. It's like, well, 
maybe if it feels as easy as, as, as it's going away, somebody coming, and I looked, and then uh, it was somebody coming pro, far, uh, pretty far back, and he was continuing the, the pace that he was, he was uh, going down the stretch, and by the 16th pole, I, I knew then, you know, that, that you know, he, yeah. he was going to win it, and uh, very excited, you know, to, you know, go into the wire, uh, knowing that, that we, we had won the derby again, uh, it was very special, obviously, for the connections. Uh, Ty and I been, uh, you know, working for that many years together and not winning for him, it was always missing, you know, so get it, get one out of the way, it was definitely very special. Is that the pinnacle, the Kentucky Derby? Uh, so absolutely, yeah. absolutely, you know, for every jockey, every trainer, owner, uh, that is our biggest uh, race uh, worldwide, no one, you know, anywhere in the world where you go and they know that you're a jockey or a trainer, whatever it is, uh, they ask if you've been in the Kentucky Derby and and the next question is how you want it. <laughs> so always come right after it, you know. So it's very, uh, very funny. No matter where you go, and uh, if, if they don't know about racing or, or follow you, uh, people that know about racing, uh, they know you you want sure. it or something. But people that don't really know it and they right, right away ask us, so have you been in the Derby or have you won it? So it's always anywhere in the world. And is that a different experience? Because I always ask trainers and jockeys how much fun it must be to, to be up here and play in front of the big crowd. But that is a big crowd. And not only a big crowd, it's a big crowd on the apron and it's a big crowd on the infield. Is it, is it a wall of sound as you go or do you zone that out? Um, you, you really zone that out. You know, you have to you have to concentrate on the, uh, what you want to do. Um, unfortunately, if you're not doing any good in the race, uh, you kind of hear everything. <laughs> but when the horse is doing well and you're running, you're in the mix of you know what you think was happening. You really concentrate. You don't you don't hear anything. Um, I mean, I've been very fortunate that I've been in the race many times, and uh, I've been on the other end too that the horse is not running really well, and all of a sudden I'm listening to every or the whole crowd and try to look in the screen to see who's winning <laughs> the race. When you're not in the money, you know. So, uh, but when you actually and 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 the nits are it, and you you have a really good chance to be in it. Uh, up to tell you the truth, you don't hear anything. I mean, you yeah, concentrate uh -huh. something that uh, as many people are sitting there, you, you don't hear anything. How about the pregame though? Because the pregame, you come out on the track, or let me ask you, the pregame, maybe the first one or two times you do it. Do you do you go uh, out and does this does you know your first or second time there? Does it kind of they play my old Kentucky home? Yes. There's a big crowd. Does that? Kind of overwhelm you a little bit. Like I said, uh, I've been very fortunate to uh, to be there plenty of times, um, and the first two three races th uh, that I went to, um, very overwhelming though. You know, and then Angel told me it's like you know the first time I went, he says like you got to go, and it was a long shot, and, and it was a friend of his uh, who trained the horse. It's like, but the experience is going to help you for for later on. And sure enough, I mean, I'm glad that I went, uh, even my first three times. You know, going in there and and see the uh, and, you know. As many people in the Derby and, and the crowd and the horses and the riding. Uh, it's a lesson to ride in the Kentucky Derby. One of the races that, that, that it's very difficult to ride. Um, so definitely a, a great experience to have. Well, once you get you get a little bit you know more comfortable and you have the opportunity to go back, you actually are more comfortable with it. You prepare yourself very well for it. Uh, so definitely it's, it's very intense. It's funny you bring that up, and uh, I I enjoy college basketball, and, and a lot of times you'll, you'll get the kind of the B level teams who take on the A level competition. And the coach says that prepares us for down the road. You know, the going Absolutely. up against the Absolutely. and it's the same the same first thing. couple same of times thing. in the derby. Maybe yeah. you're on a horse that, yeah. but it, it gets you. Know, you. And, I, and I see some some guys who come in, and, you know, for nowhere first time in the derby. Uh, I didn't win it, but, you know. Obviously, uh, having the horse helps a lot, you know, and having a good trip and everything. You are the, the, the lucky ones that I had the yeah. opportunity to go once and win it. Uh, but for, for the first time I went, I was in a long shot in, in a horse that really didn't fear to be there. But I, I, I think it was the best thing for me uh, to be there and prepare myself for later on. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned Angel as well, Angel Cordero. Your agent, long time. You've been a great team. Uh, how important has he been to your career? Absolutely. I mean, without him, I wouldn't be here. Obviously, you know, I came here to the States uh, to live with him. He was the one who uh, brought me here from Puerto Rico. Um, later on, when he retired, um, he went to training, and it was still, you know, we were in contact. So we, we always stayed in contact, and, and uh, we always, uh, I always told him that with the day, if the, the day that training doesn't work for you, you had to come and work for me, and that's how it happened. You know, right away, came to work for me. We did it really well right from the get go, and it kind of took off from there. What was your background? You mentioned Puerto Rico. Were you, were you riding there, and then came here? Well, I went to the school in Puerto Rico, okay. you know, and then I rode there only two months, and you know, so I. I I think I rode maybe 35 horses uh, before I came to New York, so I was very green when I came to, to New York. Did you go right from Puerto Rico right to New York? New York, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. I came to live with Angel. So um, when I got home, when I got to his house, 
Um, he says, like, well, we're going to learn everything from scratch. Forget it, what you learn over there because it's totally different when you come to New York. Uh, so it was a lot of watching uh, the races, uh, you know, a lot of working out, a lot of them there's just uh, an equalizer. Um, and a lot of learning, you know, you got to learn all the different places where to be on the racetrack, uh, all the different styles of training, the style of riding. Uh, so all the stuff for me, it was all very new. I didn't, I don't have any background from racing, so I came in. Uh, oh, no to family the No family. No, so I didn't know anything about the racetrack. So I had to learn everything from scratch. Uh, so when it came to New York, it was all new to me too. Then what? What brought you to the racetrack? What, if you didn't have family, what, what made you say, hey, I love want to be a horses. Okay. I love for the horses. I did, uh, my family uh, had horses. My, my, my uncle had horses in the farm and uh, growing up around horses, but uh, nothing on the racetrack. I mean, uh, it was totally different. When I went to the racetrack, I had to learn everything from scratch. Uh, but yeah, it was just love for the horses and the competition. Uh, I wanted to learn how to ride, you know, and all of a sudden I said, uh, I can make a living out of it. Well, maybe that's what I should do. <laughs> well, it worked, worked out very, very well. Uh, um, and talk a little bit about, do um, uh, you remember your first winner? Yes, Rodas. Was it Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Okay. He in New York for, actually, it's very funny because my first winner was for Marjorie Cordero, which was uh, oh, okay. wife at the time. Um, and my brother Jay, that was the name of the horse. Uh, and I, uh, Survived the inquiry. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I sweat it out a little bit. <laughs> yes. I survived the inquiry too, so it was my first winner. Uh, Manjo was so mad, but we still won it anyway. <laughs> I'm always curious, guys like you at the top of the game, what, what your game plan is going into a race day. Is there a lot of studying of tapes of your horses and the competition, uh, the past performances? You, what do you do planning for a really, race day? You really have to study everything because, I mean, and, and then you have to pay attention to the track, how the track is playing as well. But, you know, the whole thing is how the competition, you know, if you, ha if you don't remember a horse, you, you, you like to go and watch tapes and if you haven't ride them, so, you know, you, you're going to get a little bit of input from the trainers and the people who are uh, uh, ride the horse before, uh, but I, I kind of like to see uh, m more about how they were ridden uh, before and what can I uh, what can I do to improve the, the uh, on that particular uh, particular race that I'm going to ride them, and then you get the input from the from, from the trainers and see if it, that matches a little bit. But to tell you the truth, you have to change it. You know, even though they give instructions that how they like the horse to be ridden, they have to change. You know, normally. Uh, it doesn't happen the way we yeah. plan it all the time. Yeah, so you have to change. So you got to you got to prepare yourself because the competition changes as well. And when once that gate is open, you got to be prepared for. It. So you, I don't want to be I don't want to be surprised for anything. So I want to be prepared for every possible scenario that can happen in the race. Uh, I wanted to pull up another race from the weekend because you talk about experience, and I think experience played into that nice win. Uh, not chastise. Uh, a lot of us were kicking ourselves. There's one or two every season, it seems like. John Velasquez and Todd Pletcher get away at $44. But we're going to watch. Uh, I think we're going to pick it up on the far turn here. And just talk us through a little bit what you're thinking as a jockey. Chastise is going to be the number five horse. You're saving all kinds of ground here. And the silks are listed as orange, so those Claiborne silks, but they're kind of yellow silks on the rail there. And you're saving all the ground, and then there's kind of no room. But, man, you squeeze through a little hole here. Talk us through this. You know, I, I, I was very surprised the way she took everything. I, mean, I won her in Kentucky and Keeneland, and uh, I was basically the same, the same uh, type of uh, trip that I had here, but I, I, get, I did get to go out in Keeneland, and she went, out and went, went away and won pretty easily. Um, so it's funny, cause talking about homework, I, so I do my homework, and I said, like, let, let me see how I wrote it that day, and it was, it was, I was outside, and um, I, I went and watched the replay, and I was inside the whole way, the only one horse inside of me, and she was, she was actually taking me uh, into a place that I wanted it to be. And then when I got to the quarter pool, I pulled out, and she actually won it. This time, it was a little bit different. You know, I, I had no place to get out, only the little place they got in, in between. And I was like, well, she's brave enough to get here. I'm going to try to push it <laughs> through there. And she took it. And once she took it, you know, the other horse kind of came over her, but I already had the spot, and she put a really good fight. So, I mean, when it works out for, for you and the horse helps you to do it, it, it makes you really, really good. But that's a lot of experience, too, because you have to trust the horse is going to have the guts to do that. And yeah. I'm sure you, you have was written enough to she, know she as we go, was, you, you know, yeah. okay, we're, we're She was going. definitely giving me the, the sign that she was going to yeah. take it, though, you know, yeah. and, and I was ready had it run into that point that when the hole opened up, she was there, and she took it right away. You know, normally the horse comes a little bit, and they, they, they suck out of there. I mean, she didn't do that. She actually went yeah, forward. Yeah. And I was like, oh, make me look good, baby. Yeah, yeah, that, was, yeah, that, was, uh, that looked like it was a great ride. 
I wanted to uh, pull up a couple of stakes as well and talk a little bit about a couple of stakes win earlier. And again, uh, a great meet for you up here at Saratoga once again. But I wanted to go back and uh, watch the Adirondack. It's number uh, one, Pure Silver, getting it done in here. Well, you run away and hide from this field. You were the favorite, but coming out of some New York bread races, so the question mark was moving in against open company. Part of the plan when you're racing with two-year-olds, now this was her third career start, but is part of the plan with two-year-olds to get out there and get them an education as well? Well, you know, sometimes when, you know, the first time, I'm obviously riding for Top Rush for so many years. I mean, I worked a lot of these horses, and we know how they are in the morning and how quick uh, we put them into the game, you know, so come out of the gate, we, we like to put him in at least one, two, three with not that much dirt, gets, get, uh, hits him in the faces, and go from there. And she's chilling uh, every time she's, she's, she's run, she's pretty quick out of the gate. So we, we, we want to change anything today, you know, this, this day. Um, I was post one, I broke a little slow, so I, I wanted to make sure I was close enough that no dirt uh, was on her face. And sure enough, I mean, I inherited the lead. I mean, no one went with me. And, then down the quarter pole, when I asked her, she responded right away and got away from, from the horses very easily. Um, I was very surprised that she did it that easily. Because, I mean, the last the time before, that somebody came to her and she had to put a, uh, a fight to it. This time, she got away, yeah. so it was very nice. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. a very impressive performance. Nice little New York bread there. Also, want to go back uh, a little earlier in the meet, pull up the Amsterdam. Uh, this one's a three-year-old, but a really lightly raced three-year-old. Cole Front wins the Amsterdam. Only the third career start. A couple of wins uh, to start the career. You were on board at the Belmont when uh, Javier was on board back at Keeneland to start the career. That was back in April. But, boy, this is a really nice and up-and-coming three-year-old. So uh, what are your thoughts on Cole Front going forward? You know, it's funny because I was working this horse uh, back last year here, you know, and he was working incredible. And um, obviously something happened to him that... Uh, uh, didn't run last year and then came back uh, uh, in April this year. Uh, then again, I worked it. I worked him uh, down in Florida, and he went to Keeneland. I went to uh, work. Uh, always dreaming uh, okay. down to Florida, so he stayed in uh, in Keeneland. So I, I, I didn't have the opportunity to ride him then, and that's why uh, Javier rode him the first time out. Um, so and then after that, obviously, I, I got to ride him back and. Uh, so I've been waiting for this horse for a long time, let's put it that way. He's been working really well. We knew about him. Very talented horse, you know. It just happened to show up, and then he, he's done it very, very well. Yeah, and it, yeah. It, there's certainly a little future here for mm -hmm. Cole Front. Uh, just before we let you go, I want to talk some nuts and bolts on the jockey side. When I get trainers or jockeys in here, particularly guys like you who are uh, you know, veterans and, and have uh, uh, done it at the highest level of the game, I always like to get some of the nuts and bolts. First, uh, you were over, I mean, Mick mentioned it, uh, you had a great speech introducing uh, Javier into the, the Hall of Fame this year, which demonstrates uh, you guys go out and compete, but there's certainly com camaraderie in the jockey's room. You know, um, Javier and I, and a few other ones, even Ramon, you know, it's like I, I saw them when they, they uh, when they came to this country in Florida when I went to the, in the wintertime, and I met them there, and they just started riding, and they were, they, they were doing really well by the time I got there in the winter. Um, but they they knew that I was been riding for a few years already, kind of was just, uh, stable and doing, you know, riding good races and everything, so happens to uh, be in the same corner with the same valley and all that stuff, so I know, I know them for, for a long time. And to see them grow in the way they did and always, you know, ask the questions, you try to guide them the right way, and Javier and I kind of uh, stay in contact for, I mean, from day one. Ramon went on to uh, uh, Delaware and Maryland for that time, but, you know, and then we came to New York, it was basically, we started all, uh, like, we always knew each other for a long time. Uh, uh, but anyway, Javier and I stayed here in the same circuit, going everywhere, everywhere, and uh, very, res very respectful. I mean, we compete against one another. I mean, we're very, very competitive. Um, but yeah, very, res re very respectful for the things that, that happens and things happens in the races, and we come back and we can talk about it. Um, so, it become a really good friend of mine. I uh, respect him for all the things, and not only that. I mean, how great of a jockey he's become. Uh, and in great family man so you got to respect that yeah and it, as i say just watching uh, some mm -hmm. of the jockeys certainly there's uh, obviously you guys have the competition on the, on the race course but it's nice to see that you know a little camaraderie back in the jockeys room um talk a little bit about beginning of your career when you first show up do the guys who have been around for a while mentor you a little bit and now a guy like you who's been around a while do you kind of give advice to you know the manny francos and the eric cancels and those guys when they're kind of coming up showing up on the uh, most definitely yeah when i came in obviously i came in to live with angel so i had somebody with me all the time 
Uh, but the other, the other guys like Mike Smith, Jose Santos, you know, Jerry Belly, you know, the, those guys that were here already, and I had it right with them, you know, right from, from the beginning when I came here. Um, they were very helpful, you know, they were very, very good. And if they help you out and you become a better writer, you, you become a better writer, so it's easier to write with a better writer, let's put it that way. You know, so I think that's the way we look at it, and then that's the way I look at it too, you know, seeing the young, the young, the young writers coming up. So you, you like to give this, the same advice to them too, you know. Uh, it's safety for all of us, but not only that, it's, it's better to write with a better with a better writer than, than anything else. And I think that we've been very fortunate that you know the kids that have come up right now in the last few years. That you know, through the years, there are many come and gone. Obviously, and those are the the kids that had some talent and, and do not follow uh, you know the uh, sure. good advice. Let's yeah. put it that way. Um, they burn and crash pretty pretty soon, and these kids seem to you know have a good head, uh, listening and learning. And, and they, they, they put it into practice and they're doing really good. So, uh, yeah, so y you have to do it. You know, I think it's, it's better for all of us and, and for, for themselves, you know, for, the, for, a better, for a better future for them and for racing as well. Yeah, but you make the great point. You, mm -hmm. you teach them if they're better riders, that's mm -hmm. better for everybody, exactly. certainly. Yes. Uh, just before we let you go, I have one more kind of background nuts and bolts kind of question. You're writing during the day. Let's say uh, you're writing the fifth and you're not writing again to the eighth. What, what, how do you guys occupy yourselves during that time? <laughs> well, I read. And I play a little bit. I, I like to read, you know, and, and uh, fortunately, we let the little look at the phones and also look at the stock market and stuff like that. So I like to read into the what's happening in the world. So I, that's what I do. I normally I, I don't ride until the sixth race, so I won't be there until maybe the second race. Uh, so I have a little time in the house, and uh, obviously my kids are here, so I spend a little time with them, and then I head up to the Jackie's room. But when, I, when I'm there and I don't have anything to do, I, I go and read and look at the stock market a little bit. See how Has going. the phone thing changed? Like, could you not use your phones at some point? Uh, well, it, it used to, it, we never had phones until later now, though, you know, but uh, they have some restrictions that you're not yeah. supposed to see on the phone, but I mean, I, I think it's ridiculous because everybody has phones yeah, now and computers, days, yeah. so, you know. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a gift for us and for everybody that you, you, can, you stay in touch some, somewhere else, so, you know, I do, do some business, if you will, you know. Can you leave the jocks room during the day? No, you can't. No, once you're there, you can't leave. The and is that room. a New York rule, or that's the same? No, that's all, just, that's, that's all over it. Once you're there, you're not allowed to uh, leave the jockey room. Oh, before yeah. I let you go, and we're past time, but I, I could go on for like another hour, <laughs> but I'll let you go. But I just want to ask Royal Ascot, what's that like? Is that was incredible. I'll tell you uh, what, it's Lady know, Aurelia, yeah, that was a I, Incredible. It's just like winning a Kentucky Derby in a, in a, a, a completely different country. Uh, winning and like that, and, and not only that, Coming in and, and, and uh, mingle, mingling with the royal family it was incredible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> dream come true. <laughs> and and it, from a jockey standpoint, is that different because they, it's you know they're the straightaway racing? It's a it's, different. It's very different. You got to prepare yourself different mentally, obviously, and and try to get uh, the horse to relax. In anywhere in the world where you go, it's the whole thing. It's try to get your, your horse to relax the first part of the race and try to finish. And that was my whole key with her. You know, uh, obviously she's uh, running against all the horses uh, and. And males, not yeah. just the females, so, you know. So very concerned about that, and I wanted to save, make sure I saved the horse for the end. And uh, obviously, what a horse! I mean, as soon as I asked it to respond, and he got away from those horses like uh, they were nothing. Uh, very impressive. Yeah, definitely. that was incredible. Again, mm -hmm. Lady Aurelia, yeah. the Royal Ascot uh, this year. You won the Dubai World Cup with roses in May. Been all around the world. As I say, I could be there for another hour. When you got a guy like this, you can kind of uh, pick their brain a little bit. We appreciated the time you spent with us. I know you got a bit busy afternoon as always and it was a busy morning so we appreciate your stopping by good luck on the, the remainder you. of the meet thank you very much john velasquez again another great meet up here at uh, saratoga appreciated the visit this morning uh, abigail adset a little before that Teresa Gennaro with the uh, calendar you can visit brooklyn backstretch for the entire calendar travis stone from the uh, new york racing so association and churchill downs all right i'm going to wrap things up for racing across america for this monday morning don't forget a pick for monday uh, today with Brian Addo, a bonus Monday also at Capital OTB Bet and nighttime thoroughbred racing until Labor Day when Del Mar is racing at night. Keep all that in mind and check out CapitalOTB.com for more information. Wrapping things up, enjoy the racing this afternoon. We'll see you back here Wednesday morning. Across America with Seth Merrow. Racing Across America has been brought to you by Capital OTBbet.com, the premier online wagering site in New York State. Capital OTBbet.com, sign up today. Pennell's Restaurant, a Saratoga tradition since 1922. 284 Jefferson Street, Saratoga, just minutes from the track. Thoroughfan, 
giving the fan a voice. Find them at thoroughfan.com. Woodbine Racetrack. Pick, bet, and cheer on world-class horse racing north of the border. And the new Capital OTB mobile app. Wager anytime, anyplace, anywhere. Download it free from the iTunes Store or Google Play. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off-Track Betting. 